Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 73 of Unsweetened Sayo, the podcast. Today, I'm excited to welcome back Dr. Vera Tarman again. If you missed her first uh, podcast interview with me, I'll link it below, but it's episode 30, where she talks about food addiction syndrome. And today, we're back to talk a little bit about menopause and also how addiction becomes more entrenched over time. So really excited to dig into those. And just a little background for you, Vera is the medical director for Renaissance, one of Canada's largest drug and alcohol treatment centers. She spearheaded their new in and out patient programs in food addiction. She is the author of Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction, which is now available in audiobook, Kindle, and has been translated into French. Dr. Tarman is also in food addiction recovery herself, having maintained a 100-pound weight loss for over 10 years. She can be reached through her website, addictionsunplugged.com. So welcome back, Vera. So glad to have you back. Yeah, thank you so much for asking me again. It's always a pleasure to talk about this stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, you are an expert and I actually was talking to Vera before we were recording that I listened to episode 30 again and really enjoyed it. You know, I, I need to do that more, go back and listen because I always get something like another piece out of it, you know, that I maybe didn't get the first time around. So just maybe to start off, do we just want to talk a little bit, and I know we kind of did this last time, but about food addiction syndrome and maybe yeah, I think, talk a I little think, bit about that? I think it's a good idea to talk about that, particularly in light of the fact that by the time people are listening to this, Halloween is either just around the corner or, or just happened, and then there's American Thanksgiving, and then there's Christmas or whatever whatever version of that will look but rest assured that no matter how those holidays play out food and sugar will be in there somewhere um, and uh, I, I think it's a, a good thing to understand the concept of sugar and sugar addiction which is kind of my my uh, passion to talk about that um, uh, you, you know there's a lot of people now um, on the internet and uh, on, on podcasts talking about the addictive nature of sugar, which is great because it means that people are really recognizing the importance of um, what sugar can do. Mainly we're talking about it in the concept of physical health, like obesity and uh, diabetes. But I, I like to focus on the mood angle and on the addictive angle. Um, and you know, we're understanding more, yes, food or sugar in particular is addictive. And so that's good. Uh, I like to, because I'm an addictions physician and I see this in my practice, my addicts, not just sugar addicts, but regular uh, people suffering from addiction. Um, I see what can be developing as not just a, being addictive to sugar because they're eating, you know, sugary foods, but an actual food addiction syndrome. And, and that's uh, an actual entity it's kind of like the difference between somebody who drinks alcohol you know recreationally maybe a bit too much but you know then they they decide that they're going to stop um and are able to stop versus the person who's moved into the next phase of their drinking uh, career or sugar eating career uh so that it becomes a syndrome in and of itself and even if they're they don't want to eat sugar they don't they you know they're now they've got diabetes or they've got a uh you know weight that they want to lose they find that they're struggling in such a way that no matter what uh, they can't stop and and when you start exhibiting behaviors that are indicative of addiction uh, then there's no reason why we can't say you can be addicted to food in the same way as you can be addicted to cocaine or nicotine or alcohol and that's sort of where i want to uh, stake my claim is that that condition exists we see it all the time and it can be treated in the same way as any other addiction can be yeah yeah. yeah, I think that's really important because still, you know, addiction, sugar addiction isn't medically recognized. So, oh, you yeah. know, we have to kind of fight against that because, you know, anyone that feels the addiction knows that it, that it is <laughs> true. I mean, <laughs> the, and like you said, it looks very similar to other addictions that you're treating. You're, you're not just treating sugar addiction. So yeah. Yeah, and in fact, what often happens is um, uh, I, I'm, when I see people, it's best to just think I'm treating addiction, not specifically 
cocaine addiction or something because the person may not have had an issue with sugar but you know the moment they put down their i mean think about somebody who's quitting smoking now they're eating all the time uh but you know in in my uh, practice that you know they put down the troublesome alcohol and now all of a sudden they're eating like they never did before because they haven't put down the addiction per se it's just transferred from the alcohol to the sugar or the cocaine to the sugar or more commonly in the larger population nicotine smoking to sugar um, yeah, yeah, so we, and so we'll see the same type of behavior. And if I can just recap very briefly, um, you know, when, you know, what's the difference between somebody who's struggling a little bit versus a syndrome? Um, uh, you know, when we talk about, you know, addiction per se, you know, it's a craving that um, becomes dominant and um, crowds out general life. Like I might want to, you know, see a friend, but uh, I might, I'll want even more to have my uh, tub of ice cream at night. And so I'm going to cancel the friend because I'd rather have the ice cream. It, it, it kind of crowds into my life. And so it becomes an obsession. And, and then if, if um, uh, that obsession gets to the point where, you know, impairment occurs, like losing or pardon me gaining weight or diabetes or whatnot um that's the second criteria so you know obsession impairment and then you know you think i oh, better try to stop and you find you can't stop that's the third criteria and then you literally can't stop um uh, no matter how much you try that's the fourth criteria so like if you can fulfill all of those it doesn't matter what the drug is that's addiction Mm -hmm. and, and the sneaky thing about addiction uh, is, is so that really the fifth criteria is what we call denial in the addiction world. Um, it's really just a, a minimizing of the negative effect of this whole thing so that the person says, um, uh, yeah, I eat too much, but, um, you know, I'll tomorrow I'll go on a diet. It's not that bad. And that kind of um, diminishing of the significance, we see that with alcohol, like the person is sitting there um, well, actually, we see that with cigarettes, the person is standing outside with their oxygen tank with em emphysema, still puffing a cigarette saying, what's one more cigarette? Well, as a doctor, as you know, we know, <laughs> but for the, per the patient, they've minimized it. And it's kind of like a delusion that belongs to addiction in the same way as the delusion of uh, a, a cocaine psychosis belongs to cocaine. You know, people are listening to me on the phone. It's this crazy thinking that they believe this is our crazy thinking. What's one more? It's not going to make a difference. I'll start tomorrow. So if you can fulfill all of those, that is an addiction. That's not just a little bit of struggle with addictive foods. And, and, and the, the, you try to control that. You try to stop that. You can't. It's become a phenomenon in and of itself. And it requires the treatment that addiction requires. And that's where I want to stake my claim. Uh, there's... Uh, uh, you can go to Weight Watchers, you can go to a food coach, but if they don't get that, you're not going to get better. Yeah. yeah. And that moderation isn't going to exactly. help. You know, if you are a true sugar addict, the only treatment is abstinence. So. Yeah, that's right. Or you could do a harm reduction approach like we do in addiction medicine by using sweeteners and struggling when we call that, um, uh, oh my gosh, what do we call it now? That, that idea of white knuckling it, you know, you're constantly looking for something because you can't have the thing you really want. I mean, this happens in the harm reduction world. You, you take something that's of lesser um, danger, uh, but you're still in, on the addiction treadmill wanting something. And the only way to get off of that is exactly what you said, which is uh, ab abstaining from your substance, which in this case is sugar. People don't want to hear that. But if you buy into, yes, this is a syndrome and I'm going to do what I have to do, you'll get treated. You'll be treated mm -hmm. successfully. Yes. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit more than I think that leads into how addiction becomes more entrenched over time. Yeah. To touch on that a little bit. Yeah. So if you buy into the idea that uh, this is an addiction, then um, uh, one of the things that uh, I mean, we say that addiction, just like obesity, but addiction in this case is a chronic progressive condition. Uh, so once you've got this condition, um, I don't know if stopping the addictive foods means that you're now home free. And it, it, it's a bit like once you're a diabetic, you're a diabetic. You, you can, you can uh, uh, take medication and you can eat well and your sugars can normalize. But the moment you stop 
eating well, your sugars soar back up into the uh, stratosphere because you've still got the disease of diabetes. It's just uh, it latent. And similarly with food addiction, once you've crossed the line, um, you can become a functional um, healthy person, but it's still latent. It's still there, chronic. And if you keep uh, uh, using sugar, food, whatever, whatever it, substance it is that you're using, you're continually damaging the receptors and it's becoming more and more of a progressive condition. Um, so on a physiological point of view, when we talk about uh, diabetes, we're talking about insulin receptors and, and the damage that occurs or you know, basically insulin resistance eventually happening. Um, in addiction, I like to say it's a very similar phenomena. Um, we don't use this terminology uh, frequently, but it would work. We could say it's a kind of impaired dopamine response, just like with an, uh, um, diabetes, it's an impaired insulin response. Um, here's an impaired dopamine response with a probable ultimate dopamine resistance. And I don't know if you can, you know, this is a chronic progressive changing of the dopamine receptors that um, becomes more and more entrenched over time. That's just the physiological piece. Then there's the whole psychological piece, which is, um, you know, dopamine being, unlike insulin, which has a very specific function of carrying sugar in the blood, dopamine has many multiple functions. And uh, I found, oh my God, I lost like 20 pounds just on that. And uh, I felt a lot freer. So um, uh, that was through the experience of watching other people who did that. So no sugar, no flour, no grains. Um, and that really worked for me. Um, and by the way, in case somebody's wondering, well, what does Dr. Tarman eat? I mean, I eat a lot of vegetables and a lot of fruit and I do eat um, dairy and, uh, um, you know, chicken and fish. Um, but you don't have to, you can, you can figure out how to get your proteins in, in the vegetable variety or legumes. Uh, but anyway, you don't have to eat grains though. Um, and so if a person is struggling, especially in menopause, try that out. And it's not that impossible. It's, it's doable. Now, in terms of what's actually happening. So it, it's not exactly clear. There's a, a, a it seems to be um, an, an, a, a proven that when a person is in, in menopause, they develop an insulin resistance. So what's happening, which then ultimately leads to what we call metabolic syndrome, which means uh, potentially diabetes and um, high cholesterol and maybe even high blood pressure, et cetera. Um, but the thing that we're most in in interested in is the um, potential for diabetes. And this is all women, I just want to say, right? I mean, we're not just... Yeah. We're not just talking about people no, it's, with sugar. This is all women. Yes, yes, yes. All women. Sorry, all women. It, it's actually all of society because we're yeah. eating this stuff. But but in menopause, it, specifically, there seems to be a heightened um, insulin resistance. So maybe the way that a, that a person was eating before was doable, but then that that sort of made you cross the line, and now you're starting to show these signs of potential disease, which is why we used to call you know diabetes type two diabetes a mature onset. So the, post-menopause, but um, that's no longer the case. Now, I'm going to step back. It's been my experience uh, watching. I don't have research to talk about this because now we're, now we're moving into areas where it just hasn't been researched, especially food addiction. But it's been my experience that when a person, menopausal or not, crosses the line and develops insulin resistance or hyperinsulinemia, which then leads to diabetes, they also uh, seem to uh, develop what looks to me like um, problematic eating. Now, which came first? Was it the food that led to the uh, uh, insulin resistance or was it possibly the other way around? We know that um, insulin uh, stimulates dopamine because uh, I, I, we have insulin to carry the uh, sugar into the cells, that's its function. And um, as that's happening, you wanna have hunger so that you put the sugar into your body in the first place. Like it, there's, it, uh, it, insulin is one of the hunger hormones. So if that's heightened because of insulin resistance, um, then you've got a higher hunger. Um, so which came first, chicken or the egg? I don't know, but I see that there's a connection. What does that mean in terms of our conversation um, that uh, a menopausal in brackets, potentially insulin um, impaired response can also lead to an impaired eating response. You're gonna have a heightened dopamine, um, which means that you wanna eat more, you're hungrier more, you're not satisfied as much. And um, 
on top of that, the addiction syndrome that I talked about earlier, that uh, um, uh, the entity itself of food addiction is partly occurs from a dopamine response because you have that heightened dopamine of a lot of sugar, I'm excited, to eventually an impaired dopamine flattening response, dopamine resistance. I need more sugar just to feel normal. And now you've got uh, uh, um, menopause, potentially hyperinsulin uh, response, which then means a, a hyperdopamine, which then means a dopamine flattening. So I, I think that there's, it, it's, it's almost like a potential walk into um, potential food addiction if you're not careful. <laughs> if you, unless you cut the sugar out, you can stop all of this. It's, it's because we're eating so much of this stuff and, and uh, uh, our dopamine becomes hypersensitive and then has to respond. I hope that was clear. That was yeah. well. What I like, what I'm taking kind of out of this too is again, this is something that all you know, women are have the potential to happen. But I can just imagine someone like me or another sugar addict that we would be even more susceptible. Yes, because you know we already are a little insulin resist. You know our resistance um, exactly, and, and that happens in puberty too. So you know uh, you see young women eating a lot more and then struggling with their weight, uh, and uh, then you know the, the, they get into the whole um, sort of eating disorder behavior of binge purging, which just uh, uh, they're more. Not only is their puberty, their hormonal changing, putting them at a at a heightened. Um, um, predisposition, but also that behavior of binge purging puts you in a predisposition because it's a very addictive like pattern. I, and I'm convinced that a lot of, uh, I, I, I'm not saying eating disorders don't exist. I think that they do, but uh, a lot of eating disorder, disorder behavior is either disguised or um, muddied up with food addiction so that the treatment of eating disorders ends up being very complicated because it's not useful for food addiction. Yeah. It gets very messy which I found because um, I, that describes me perfectly. You know, I had, I had addiction early on as a young four or five year old kid. And then when I hit puberty though, it's when I started gaining weight. So I finally yeah. started the diet binge cycle, you know, that continued for years and years and years. And I actually, you know, read about binge eating disorder. I thought I had, it created disordered eating, but really underneath was the food addiction. I think so. And, I went to probably three different places, like in a pretty big, um, you know, like um, to for eating disorder treatment centers, one in Seattle, that's pretty well known. And no one could help me because it was all about moderating yes. your food, which yes. I do think helps people that actually, you know, because there are some people that don't have an addiction that do have eating disorders and that's great yeah. treatment for them. But there's so many people I think like me yeah, don't get the help that they need and spend, I don't even know how much money I've spent on that thinking, wow. you know, and therapists that I saw trying to like solve this. And it wasn't until I gave up sugar and flour and became abstinent. I don't have any kind of disordered eating now. Wow. Um, you know, it was really just those foods that I ate in an unhealthy way. Like I, yeah. and some people that, you know, they might continue to binge either even on healthier foods, but that just wasn't me. I'm not going to overeat vegetables, you know? No. no. Um, and, and, you know, it, it would be like me saying to you, um, you're a diabetic, but you can have this sugar and, and uh, you know, don't let your, your blood sugar go off. Like you right. just can't, like it, it's not possible to do. And similarly, this is a physiological condition. I really want to emphasize that. It's not a matter of willpower. It's like, I can't. Now I can choose not to pick up the substance, but, but that dopamine response is such that that's all I'm thinking about. I may not pick it up, but once I've had a little bit, even if I put the rest of it in the freezer, I'm still thinking about it in the freezer. And at three in the morning, I'm going to creep down and get it because that's when my willpower has run out. Or worse, when you throw something out in the trash, because you're going to be good. And then you dig it out of the trash <laughs> the next morning right. <laughs> for that in the middle exactly. of the day. I've been exactly. done. That. Yeah. Exactly. And that's the same type of behavior we see with cocaine addicts who are spending their last $5, not on the rent, but on their drive. Like it's the same drive. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think that it's, it's a useful thing to also say so that we are not so judgmental about our cocaine addicts because it's the same thing we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. It's just one is laughed at and one is like, you know, we shake our heads and are very judgmental. 
Um, but I, you know, if, if, if a person who says food addiction is not an addiction, it doesn't drive you to the same behavior, it's just because they haven't had somebody be honest enough to say, oh yes, I eat from the garbage. And uh, I just don't tell you because I'm, t I, I'm too full of shame. Right, right. Yeah. And that's why it's really important um, for me to see it medically recognized because I think there's so many people that aren't getting the right treatment then, you know, yeah. like, um, so I know you I, went three times you said and spent all that money. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, just me. And I'm one of those people that research and does things and, um, you know, loves to read about stuff, but there's many people that are just going to do what their doctors tell them. And if they say, yeah. no, that's not a thing, you just need moderation. They're just going to be trying yeah. to knuckle that forever and really yeah. think something's wrong with them when really yeah. it's the treatment, you know, not them. So that's one of my hopes for having it medical rec recognized is just so more people can get the help that they need. Cause I just, yeah. many people are struggling Yes. Um, unnecessarily, you know, yeah. and, and not just as an option, you know, there's, you know, you have to be ready to do it. I truly believe that too. You got to, you know, come to your yeah. own being ready to, to start that journey, but at least hear it as an option. <laughs> yeah. Well, usually people um, are not ready because they don't really have hope in the, in the, in the solution. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we need to have more people like you, like this podcast to, to give hope. Like, yes, there is really, this is not just a few, a couple of people who are extreme fringe radical people, you know, it's, it, it, there, there's just a lot of people out there. We're just not getting the same airtime. And, you know, that's where we can, you know, really point fingers to the food industry, which makes me sound like some kind of uh uh, what was the word that somebody, um, oh, and a, a quack, like it sounds like a quack. <laughs> it's not a quack, you know, anyway. All right. and there's so much to dig into with the food industry too, but I want to go yeah. back to menopause a little sure. bit because, yeah. um, you know, again, you, you said, I just want to make sure every listeners heard that you gave up kind of the third thing you needed to give up the grains to yes. Yes. help with the insulin resistance. You yes. lost 20 pounds. Yes. And tell me now, because I'm curious now on the other end of it, then how it feels like has your well, weight uh, been pretty steady and since yes. Yes, my weight is pretty steady. I'm, I, it, I'm, I have to be honest, my, my weight loss is now at 98 pounds, not 100, but it's easier just to say 100. <laughs> um, and and uh, I, I, uh, I would say that my, um, I, I no longer have the obsession that I used to have. I mean, it was all um, my life was around my three meals or in that, in the, in the old days, it was a grazing. It was the whole time. And, and, you know, it was always this thing of, of, am I hungry enough that I can still eat so that I'm not uncomfortable? Like that whole negotiating, navigating thing, all that's gone. I eat three meals. That's all I have. And when I'm hungry, I'm thinking about my meal, but it's appropriate. So it's fine. I have to admit that as I get older, um, I now am wondering, because I do think there's still a chronic progressiveness, that there is a physiological thing, that I may have to eventually get rid of dairy because I eat a lot of yogurt. I don't eat um, cheese anymore, but I do eat yogurt and I'm now wondering, um, uh, I wonder if I should dump that one because I do think about it a little more than I should. Uh, but, you know, this is, it's not an obsession, it's, it's, it's at that level of my addiction at one point was like 10 out of 10. And now on a bad day, it might be a three and a half, four on a bad day. Most of the time it's a two, two and a half. It's not a zero, I'll be honest. Um, maybe it would be if I knocked off the dairy, uh, but I don't know. Cause I do think that at some point people will have to knock things off. Like I, I got rid of sweeteners this year for uh, a number of years. I still had sweeteners. I knew, knowing that I should get rid of them. Um, uh, so I think that basically I'm now postmenopausal, um, yeah. more and more sensitive to things. And we'll see. I may even have to cut more vegetables out. I don't know. Like, yeah, I think you have to choose. Yeah. I can't eat potatoes anymore. Listen, I was curious if you do potatoes, sweet potatoes. No. No, I don't eat sweet potatoes. I did eat those and I cut those out. So now it's mainly the greens like, uh, well, and whites, I guess like broccoli, cauliflower, um, cabbage, sauerkraut, you know, that kind of stuff, lettuce, uh, but not the really starchy stuff. I'm even cutting out less carrots and beets, although they were great for a while. So, uh, but no more sweetener and maybe by next year, dairy, I might check that one out. I'll see. Yeah. And I think that's important just for listeners 
to understand that it does evolve, you yes. know, and what it you does. eat today might not be what you can eat tomorrow. And I yeah. always say though, in the beginning, just cut out the sugar and the flour. Yes, yeah. absolutely. That will make a huge difference. And, and at the very, very beginning, if you're drinking any pop and juice, get rid of that first. Get rid of that. Yeah, the liquid stuff first. Yeah. And that um, includes, and you're not going to, maybe people won't want to hear this, but that does include alcohol. Uh, I, I do think that uh, it's pretty hard to be a successful abstinent uh, sugar abstinent person if you're still drinking alcohol. Yeah. And yeah. I gave it up. I gave up alcohol for the first like over a year because I knew that too. And now I have it every now and again, but I have to say my tolerance and even oh. like taste for it has pretty much gone away. Yeah. You know, I might be able to have like three sips of a glass of red wine or a little beer in the summer, but really like a few sips and that's all I can do. My body is just like, nope, <laughs> it doesn't I do, anymore. I have one more thing to say about menopause if I can. Yeah. Um, and, uh, the other thing about menopause is that like puberty, it's a time of high emotional volatility. And um, the idea of using food as a comfort um, is a real invitation. And, you know, and it tends to be more the savory stuff because um, uh, if you think about it, when you're in men you're angry all the time and rageful and you know uh, it, it, that's just the hormones it's just it's just the estrogen uh, depletion and you know more progesterone and you know it's 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 a hormonal mad madness madhouse in there um, and so food will uh, be more soothing than it might otherwise be and you know if you think about what the, the neurochemistry of food is we talk a lot about dopamine that's the excitement thrill looking for the, the wonderful birthday cake i'm going to have in a minute that stuff but there's also the endorphin effect which is like dairy and and wheat like bread so people will say okay i'll quit sugar but i'm not going to quit my bread i'm not going to quit my bagels um or ice cream which has dairy it has it has a dopamine effect but it also has an endorphin effect and endorphins are are neurochemicals that uh, make us feel like pain is okay i can do it i can manage i'm good um it's it's our uh, it's, it's our numbing our pain relieving neurochemicals that get inspired by um uh, uh endorphins which where do we get endorphins we get it from um dairy milk we get it from wheat uh gluten we get it from um uh, uh chili spices spicy food so it's not just the sweet stuff um so there's the endorphin piece and then there's also the serotonin and that's the uh, like the pastas that, that's that sleepy feeling after uh, a turkey and people will overeat on all that stuff too so it, they are actually self-medicating potentially a um, hormonal storm. And if you're not a food addict, be aware that that will be calling you too. Like you may not have crossed that line into food addiction syndrome, but just by virtue of being in menopause, you're at risk for using food in this way. Yeah. Do yeah. you feel like since you did, because that was part of my motivation to give up sugar and flour is because I, I had polycystic ovary syndrome. I've had uh, hormonal stuff always that I've struggled with. And so I really thought, hey, if I give up sugar and flour now, I'm going to be a lot better shape for menopause. Yeah. Do you feel like that helps some of the mood volatility, some of the hormone, I think absolutely. it's a hormone madhouse. I love that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, absolutely. I'm 63 years old now. I, I'm on no medication. Uh, except for a few vitamins like um, vitamin D and magnesium. Um, I, I uh, um, don't have any arthritis to speak of. Like I, I don't have any diabetes. Uh, like um, my aging process of my peers versus me, like I'm, I'm like, I can only attribute that. Maybe I have good genes, but I don't know about that. Uh, I think it's, I have a good diet. So I think that um, all of those conditions, the hyperinsulinemia, all that stuff, which is in an invitation post-menopause have not happened to me. And uh, I, I, I also um, walk a lot. There was no way when I was eating sugar, the idea of a walk was only, you could, you could, you could convince me to walk if we were gonna walk to a coffee shop where I could have a little treat. Mm -hmm. Like I used to call them full walks. It was like a joke, like let's go for a walk because it meant a walk to a restaurant. Um, 
and uh, I would huff and puff. And now I walk all the time and I enjoy walking, you know, with my uh, earphones and whatnot. Um, so uh, I said, and I was in my 40s like you when I started this whole process just at that point with uh, no sugar. I said, I feel like I've gained 10, 10 years of my life back. And I still feel that way now because I don't feel 63, especially when I look at my uh, colleagues. Um, I would say probably more like early 50s. I am getting a bit tired now, like at the end of the day more than I used to, but uh, it's nothing like, and the moods, uh, well, I mean, I'm already well past menopause, but um, the only thing that actually I got that's very menopausal is those damn hot, hot flushes and they didn't go away. Okay. They didn't go away. However, maybe they would have been worse, who knows? Yeah. And I think that's a really good source of motivation for people out there that yeah. also, if you are, it's not too late. Like I feel like it doesn't matter what age you are, you are still going to get some really big health benefits. Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah. You know, a lot of people that are on medications and end up being able to go off medications, but I do, like you said, I think it just makes the aging process so much absolutely. easier when we you're see taking that, you know, those foods yeah. out. In my, uh, in the food addiction program at, at Renaissance, um, when it was in its full glory, I mean, now with COVID so much is, is closed down, but in, in those days, um, people, most of the people that came were women postmenopausal. I mean, there were some, you know, yes, there were younger ones, but uh, most of the ones, the, the majority were postmenopausal. Um, many of them got off their medications, uh, their, their uh, diabetic medications, or it was drastically reduced. So absolutely uh, age has no you'll benefit for sure and they lost weight and it's the it's that stalled weight that you just can't no matter how much you go to the gym which we, which we know isn't that effective anyway but no matter how much you go to the, no matter how much you cut down on your calories unless you cut down on the right ones doesn't make any difference but it did if they cut down on the sugar and the flour yeah so yeah. i think that's a huge huge motivator for people yeah. that are listening um, and that, again, you don't have to, I just don't want people to get overwhelmed. You don't just start out that way. It's why I always told myself, I'm just giving up the sugar and flour. Yeah. I didn't worry about measuring, weighing foods. Yeah. I still ate like popcorn and things in the beginning. Like mm -hmm. all I was trying to eliminate was sugar and flours. And yeah. then I think then you continue to experiment and tweak as you find, like you exactly. said, suddenly you had to give up grains. Now you're thinking yeah. about giving up dairy. Yeah. And it's just going to look different for everybody of when yeah. you that and that's kind of where it's your own journey so um yeah. I think it's just being for me I try to look at stuff that I have a hard time moderating if there's a food that I have a hard time eating in moderation yep yeah. I probably need to let that go <laughs> exactly that's kind of where I am with my yogurt <laughs> yeah. it kind of tells you yeah it's like yeah. maybe time to let that go so yeah. um yeah. But this has been so wonderful, Vera. I'm so glad we talked about menopause. That's something near and dear to my heart as I'm probably as going through that journey. Um, yeah. And yeah. anything I can do to make it smoother. Um, I do eat grains right now, I will just say, but that is always tucked in my head that there might be a time. And I, I don't yeah. eat them daily by any means, maybe like yeah. once or twice a week, but that's probably something and I do still eat sweet potatoes. That's something yeah. that I might have to tweak in the future if I yeah. see, you know, that I do start gaining. Yeah. But it's been amazing. I've been at the same weight now for over two years once my weight kind of fluctuated. Yeah. And gosh, that just feels <laughs> like a miracle itself, you know? I know. Yeah. Um, my weight. How much weight did you lose? I don't know because I don't believe in weighing myself. I think. <laughs> Weight is not a good indication of overall health. So I just don't yeah. believe in it. But from mm -hmm. clothing and stuff, I estimate somewhere around 80 pounds, 60 to 80 yeah. pounds, you know. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, and, and not having to wake up in the morning, like, is this going to fit? Do I have anything to wear? I mean, yeah, I, love, I know. Love That's a horrible thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not following a food plan. I'm not counting calories. I'm not. I'm yeah. just not eating my, you know, drug foods and uh, I've been able to stay at this consistent weight. So that, that feels amazing. Yeah. Um, and I'd yeah. love to see that ha continue through <laughs> yeah. years as I tweak and adjust as I need to. So, yeah. yeah. But, um, well, thank you so much. Is there anything else um, maybe that we didn't cover that you had 
or just any last words of advice for anyone that you might I, You know, I just always like to say my last words are, uh, if you're thinking you'd like to do this, two things. One, it's if you actually do it, like make a decision to quit sugar and flour. I would throw in flour as well, but even if it's just sugar, um, it isn't as hard as it sounds if you do it. So it's just the first couple of weeks, there is a withdrawal. It will feel, that will feel awful get the support. Uh, and then once you get over that hump, that, that two or three weeks, it actually gets easier every day. Uh, so that's the first thing I'd say. Then the second thing I'd say is please get support. Don't try to do it yourself. So that then, and if I can say it again, my, my Facebook group, the uh, I'm Sweet Enough Sugar Free for Life or another one um, and uh, just get support. Uh, don't feel bad about it. Um, uh, and yeah, and then, and then uh, I'll see you on the other side. Yes. <laughs> well, I will link your Facebook support group, your YouTube channel, your website too. If you want to reach out to Dr. Vera, um, you know, you can reach her through her website and please, please check out her book, Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. If you haven't already, it's wonderful and now available in different formats. So that's thank amazing. You, <laughs> yes. So thank you again so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for asking.